Well, good morning. It is Friday morning. Oh my goodness, it's Friday morning. Unbelievable. I cannot believe it's already Friday. It's Friday morning. <clears throat> it's cold here in Maryland. We're supposed to have a little bit of rain. I have a much better setup. Steve helped me bring a little desk in here into our bedroom. And so, <clears throat> so uh, let me just tell you, yesterday, if you watched yesterday's Bible study, uh, my iPad fell off. I had it super precarious up on some cushions and, and some other things, and, and it fell off. And um, I, I watched it yesterday, and I was like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. What a crazy day yesterday. But you know what? What, what a good word God gave us yesterday. I mean, Proverbs 11 is just so full of so many ways that once we do what God is asking us to do, or once we accept, once we receive what God is putting into our lives, then he puts so much back into our lives. I mean, it is truly pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I I got my hair cut yesterday. My beautician is a Christian. I think most of you know that. And she and I were talking about different things that, you know, are going on in the church and and in the world today, and we just encourage one another. I, listen, I love her so much. I love my Vicky, and um, we've been going to her for a long time. So while Steve got his cut, we couldn't be at the shop at the same time. <clears throat> so while Steve got his haircut, I sat out in the car and just played back through just part of yesterday's little adventure uh, of mine. And um, wow, God really is revealing himself to us. And he's stopped letting, letting us put obstacles in our way. If we are truly seeking after God, if we are truly trying to find him, trying to learn what his word is saying to us, then he's just removing obstacles. He's making a straight way for us. Can you say amen? I mean, just amen and hallelujah. As we continue today in Proverbs 11, I want you to look how there is a, a balance system. I mentioned it yesterday, and uh, truly it is a good balance system of if, if the righteous man will continue doing this, then God will give him deliverance. God will give him rescue. God will uh, give him wisdom. And then it talks about the wicked man. And the wicked man will continue to just have downfall. The wicked man will continue to be someone that the Lord detests. Detest. You know, um, when people say hate is such a strong word, detest is a worse word. And for anybody to say, you know, the Lord detests that. Well, I'm going to perk up my ears and listen. Solomon was a wise man in his own right. But as he penned this proverb, he was under the anointing and under the inspiration of God. It was God speaking through Solomon. Solomon was his chosen vessel. Now, the good news is God can use anybody he wants to to speak through. He even spoke through a donkey. And yet, this is one of those times where God gave Solomon this wisdom. It's all Solomon asked for. He said, God said, you can have whatever you want, basically. And, and Solomon said, you know, I would just want, I just want wisdom. So in Proverbs 11, we are the recipients of all of this wisdom that God poured into Solomon and then pinned onto this page. And then God inspired, the translations were inspired by men and women of God. And that gives us in our hands this translation that is so bountiful with good news. Now, for the wicked, not so much good news. But we're not worrying about them. I'm not going to be anxious about them. I'm not going to worry about them. Yesterday, after Bible study, I took uh, some soup over to the church. And on my way home from the church... And those of you who know where I live, uh, I live out in Tantallon, and the church is over, uh, uh, in, it's in Fort Washington, but it's right on the line, Oxen Hill and Fort Washington. And between here in my house and there to the church, it's about a 15-minute drive, and that's fair. 
That's not me speeding. That's that's about fair, about a 15-minute drive. And in that 15-minute drive, I was cut off four different times by drivers who were, seemed to be oblivious to the rules of the road, seemed to be oblivious that anybody else was out and about. And it was just by the grace of God that I was able, I was being very careful, I was watching the road <clears throat> because because uh, uh, 210 is bad enough, but then some of these other roads that I traveled to get from here to the church, 15 minute drive, cut off four different times, so I was being very careful. That's the way, if God calls us and we set out to follow him, there's going to be wicked people. There's going to be jerks. There's going to be self-centered people. There are going to be people who do not follow the rules, who do not care about the rules. They don't care about the standards. They don't care about any of that. But let me tell you, a day is coming. A day is coming. Now, I don't know if any of those drivers yesterday eventually got stopped by the police. I, I'm just going to tell you, I'm just going to be honest. I, I kind of hope they were because they were driving so recklessly. Recklessly. But think about the people who are not following God's word and they're totally off uh, off the mark and they're just going and they're being about their own business and they're doing their own thing. They're leaning to their own understanding. They're not listening to a word God is saying to them either through his word or through his people. But they're doing their own thing. Well, this is, don't worry about them. In in uh, Proverbs eleven twenty one, it says, you know what? Don't worry about them. Don't get over into their lane. Mind your own business. Because they will not go unpunished. They will not go unpunished. So I don't have to worry about them. I'm so glad that God gave me his word and that he gave me people of wisdom who have who have surrounded me and who are teaching me. And because of that, then I know that I can just keep on my journey, keep on my path if I keep focused and if I stay in my lane and if I'm being careful, if I'm watching what I'm doing, if I'm not losing my mind and, and falling into their that temptation of, of being angry and screaming and cursing and all of those other things that people do when they have road rage. I'm just, I'm just not going to fall into that. I'm not going to let the enemy pull me into his snare. I'm going to keep an eye out. And how do I keep an eye out is to know what the snare looks like. To know what the, where the snares are. So Proverbs 11, that's what it's telling us. Father, I thank you for your word. Father, I thank you that you continue to just give us wisdom. That, Lord, you continue to show us your path. That you continue to show us your rules and your laws and your commands and your decrees. Lord, I thank you that you are keeping us in our lane as we keep our focus on you. In Christ's name, amen, amen, amen. All right. So, Proverbs 11 um, <clears throat> 11, 7, Proverbs 11, 7, Proverbs 11, 7. This says, when a wicked man dies, his hope perishes. All he expected from his power comes to nothing. When a wicked man perishes, all his hope comes to nothing. We have a hope. We have an eternal hope. And when we die as Christians, then we have eternal life. But this is saying, you know, these, these wicked people, they've put their hope in money. They've put their hope in other people. They've put their hope in themselves. And when they die, that's all gone. That's all gone. That's all gone. So Proverbs 11, 7 kind of steps out of this weights and balances thing, and it is just stand, kind of stands on its own. When a wicked man perishes, everything he's built up, everything he's 
decided was going to be right, everything he's decided, I can base my life on that. Well, it's going to come to nothing. And then it says in Proverbs 11, 8, the righteous man is rescued from trouble, but it comes on the wicked instead. So the righteous man, the righteous man is rescued. Isn't that good news? He's rescued. But the wicked man, it's just going to keep coming around and coming around and coming around and biting him and tearing him up and causing him more trouble and more trouble and more trouble. That's why I want to stay on the righteous side of this business. Because a wicked man, he's just going to stay in trouble. And then Proverbs 11, uh, 9, with his mouth, the godless destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge, the righteous escape. Now, I know I did some of these yesterday, but honestly, yesterday got a little bit confusing, and so I'm just wanting to clarify, and we can always revisit these, right? The righteous man, the righteous man, through knowledge, he will escape, but with the uh, with his mouth, the godless destroys his neighbor. When the righteous, I'm in Proverbs 11:10 now. When the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. When good things are happening and, and when a good person is celebrated and exonerated, just think out, oh, this uh, the whole city goes crazy. And when the wicked perish, there are shouts of joy. Ding dong, the witch is dead. Right? When the wicked perish, the people rejoice. Think about through the years, through the centuries, the evil dictators, evil leaders, that at their death, instead of there being mourning and sadness, instead there was great celebration. There was great celebration. That they're gone, that their reign is gone, that their rule is over, that their influence is crushed, is no longer on top of us. Think about that. And then think about when other wicked people die. When other wicked people die. There's not mourning. There's not mourning. Think about that. But think about when the righteous overcome when the righteous prosper this is meant like <coughs> when i mentioned the other day about roberta stanfield okay roberta stanfield and she posted on facebook uh, a picture of her standing in front of that brand new mercedes with a huge bow, bow on it and i'm going to tell you her expression was exactly like i have seen on her face when she was a little bitty girl hold on one second it's joy, just, just total joy. And then I loved it that so many people were looking at that and they were like, oh, congratulations, you know, so good for you. Because when somebody who is righteous, when they prosper, we rejoice with them. And if we don't, we need to look at ourselves and give ourselves a long, hard, dirty look. If we're not able to rejoice when a brother or a sister in Christ is prospering, then something's wrong. I mean, something's bad wrong. We need to look at that. All right. So now look at, by the way, the pages came out of my Bible. So, um, and, and yes, I own another Bible, but I love this Bible so much. Uh, and I did buy some tape. Through the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted. But by the mouth of the wicked, it is destroyed. Through the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted. A city has favor. A city, a city has prosperity. A city has abundance. A city has peace. But when you talk about how, <clears throat> when a city, uh, by, by the mouth of the wicked, destroyed. We've, we've all known people who by their mouth were able to tear down cities and tear down communities. And by their mouth, they're able to tear down ministries. I really worry about those people. The mouth of the wicked. It says a city could be destroyed. A community can be destroyed. A fellowship can be destroyed. A family can be destroyed. But through the blessings, through the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted. That's why 
I say a blessing over you guys. That's why I say a blessing over my children. That's why I say a blessing over my home. When we say a blessing over things, then the city comes together, it prospers, it has peace, it has abundance. If every Christian in, a, I'm going to say, a 100-mile radius of Washington, D.C., were to come together. Think about uh, this summer when, they, when uh, Franklin Graham's prayer group came through and the other prayer group came through. I can't think of the name of that group right now, but when they all came in, Steve and I drove downtown. We didn't get out of the car, but we drove downtown, and there were hundreds of thousands of people down on that mall, Christians, and they were praying, and they were raising their hands, and they were praying, and they were singing, and they were seeking God to save Washington, D.C., to save our city, to save our country, to save this nation. And I'm going to tell you something. There was a different atmosphere in the air. You could feel it in the air. I promise you, other people could feel it. And here's how I can promise you that. Because people who were just downtown, people who were tourists, they thought they were just going to come down <clears throat> and stroll through D.C. on a beautiful sunny day this summer. And thousands accepted Christ just out there on the street just out there on the grounds. When the city actually comes under a, a just a, a landslide of prayer, of blessing, it's changed. It's changed. It prospers. There's a difference that happens. There's a difference in all of those who are participating that happens. That's why praying for your city, praying for your church, praying for your family is so important. Praying for that, believing, trusting God, no matter what you think should happen and then what actually really does happen, that's in God's hands. It is in our hands to pray a blessing. It is in our hands to fast and believe. It is in our hands to proclaim prosperity, to proclaim peace, to proclaim abundance, to proclaim provision into our cities, into our communities into our nation, and into our homes. Right over my front door is a sign that says, let the King of Glory come in. Let the King of Glory come in. Now, if somebody else comes in, that's right over their heads. That's right over their heads. It got a little thing in my, uh, in my window. Jesus never fails. All of these workmen, all of these workwomen who've been coming in at my house, Listen, they've all come under that banner. They've all come under that heading. Every time they've stepped into my house, they've had to walk under let the King of Glory come in. But beyond just a sign being posted in my home, there's also the fact that Steve and I have prayed and prayed and prayed over this home, in this home, around this home, about this home. Before we even moved in this home, we walked around it and prayed about it. We brought elders, we brought disciples, we brought uh, women deacons into our home. We brought our family into our home and we said, pray over this home. Because no matter who this home belonged to before us, it now belongs to us. And a child of God is going to be living here. And I'm going to pray a blessing over that. Because God's word tells me in Proverbs 11, um, uh, oh, 11, 11, that's easy to remember. I can pray a blessing. And through that blessing, the city is going to be exalted. Now let's look at Proverbs eleven twelve. A man who lacks judgment derides his neighbor, but a man of understanding holds his tongue. There are times when we see somebody doing something and we feel like it's our duty to go over and tell them what we think. But I'm going to tell you this. This is telling us that there are times when we have discernment and we have understanding and we know it's time for me to hold my tongue. Have you ever held your tongue so hard that you kind of bit your tongue and made it bleed? I mean, there have been times in my life where I want to tell somebody about something, but I know God has not told me to do that. 
Now this says that uh, <clears throat> a man who lacks judgment, he's just going to spout off nonsense. He's just going to continue to just say things and do things and put things out there that aren't even true. He's going to deride. He's going to denounce. He's going to make fun of. He's going to criticize. He's going to ridicule his neighbor. But a person of understanding, a person of wisdom, they know that there is a time when you hold your tongue. You hold your tongue. All right. Uh, Proverbs eleven thirteen. Listen to this one. So good. A gossip, a gossip betrays a confidence. But a trustworthy man keeps a secret. We all need to use wisdom in two ways. Not be a gossip. It's wisdom to not be a gossip. It's just wisdom to not be a gossip. Because this says a gossip is going to tell what they know. A gossip is going to tell what they know. So number one, I want us <clears throat> to not be a gossip. But number two, I want us to be careful. Careful who we confide in. Careful who we confide in. And that's all the time. I can say to Steve Lowry, hey, I've got something I want to tell you, but I don't want you to tell anybody. And I never have to worry that he's going to say from the pulpit, Jan just told me the other night about so-and-so. I do not have to worry about that. As a matter of fact, sometimes somebody will say to me, well, of course, you know uh, about so-and-so. You know, I, I had so-and-so, and I was like, I didn't know that. I had no idea about that. And they said, well, oh, well, I told Steve, and uh, I told him it was a secret, but of course I just assumed he told you everything. I, listen, not true. If you tell Steve Lowry this is a secret, or I'm telling you this in confidence, well, then you could just tell Jesus the same thing because Steve's not going to tell it. He's trustworthy. On the other hand, I know some people who are in my life that if I tell them something by the end of the day, everybody, everybody is going to know about that. Everybody's going to know my business. And I'm going to tell you something. Those of us and those of you who have ever said to somebody, I'm going to tell you something and it's a secret, but I'm just telling you because I want you to pray about it. I want you to pray about it. Listen, guys, that's gossip. If somebody tells you something in confidence, they don't want you calling everybody in the neighborhood and say, oh, uh, uh, Beverly called me this morning and, um, you know, she's, she's having a hard time with something and I, I know she would want you to know because she would want you to pray about it. You know what, Beverly told you that because you're her friend and she doesn't want you telling everybody her business. Say amen, Beverly. We have to be careful to not be a gossip. All right, next one. I could go on that one for a long time. Uh, this next one, 1114, is so good. For lack of guidance, a nation falls. But many advisors make victory sure. So we're going to talk about this in two different ways. One is just like it's written, a nation. Uh, you know, that's why uh, some of these countries that have dictators and uh, if somebody comes in and advises them to do something else uh, and, and they don't want to do it or it didn't turn out right, well, they have those people killed. They are <laughs> just dead. If we are building a family, if we are building a life, if we are part of this nation, then we need to be able to surround ourselves with good advice, good advisors. Don't call that girlfriend who every time you ask her a question, she's going to say, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. You need to go right over there to his house and you need to tell him and you need to do that and you need to say this and you need to say that or you need to do so and so. Girl, you need to get over there and take care of that. What on earth? 
don't just go to somebody who's going to always stamp their approval on every plan you have. Surround yourself with good advisors. Surround yourself with people full of wisdom, full of God's word. Surround yourself. That's how you're sure you have a good victory. He who puts up security for another will surely suffer, but whoever refuses to strike hands and pledge is safe. We've talked about this before, about being careful, about loaning money, about borrowing money. Be careful with that. All right, now look at this. Look at this, look at this, look at this. Proverbs 11, uh, yeah, eleven sixteen. A kind-hearted woman gains respect. But ruthless men gain only wealth. Only wealth. So you can be kind-hearted. And I'm going to tell you something. We can all be kind-hearted. We can all be kind-hearted. I'm going to say that one more time. We can all be kind-hearted. And if you're sitting there saying, well, it's really not my nature, well, then you need to go through Jesus Christ because he's going to create a new spirit in you, a new heart in you. You're going to be a new creation through Jesus Christ, according to Romans. Create in me a clean heart. Create in me a kind heart, oh God. Because a kind-hearted woman is going to have respect. Don't we all want respect? Don't we all want God to look at us and say, wow, what a good person. What a good person. Because she's kind. She's kind-hearted. I love it that it says a kind-hearted woman, but then it says a man who only cares about himself, all he's going to get is wealth. Only wealth. So we read before that when you die, even if you're wealthy, and you're wicked, your hope perishes. This is saying a kind-hearted person, respect, respect. I would rather have respect. I would rather have the respect of my husband and my family and all of you and my church members. I would rather have that respect than to be wealthy. I would like to be wealthy. If you could have both, that would be very sweet. But I want respect because I want it to have earned it. I want people to be able to confide in me. I want people to be able to respect me. I want people to be able <coughs> to look at me and know that I'm telling them the truth. So this is continuing. A kind man benefits himself. A kind man benefits himself. Wow. You bring a blessing on yourself. Just by being kind, you're bringing blessings on yourself. You just, you're just kind. You're just being kind, and that brings blessings back to you. But a cruel man brings trouble on himself. A cruel man, you're going to get what you deserve. If you've ever known a cruel person, it seems like they're getting away with it. But then when they get in trouble, they've brought it on themselves. Someone who is cruel. Someone who is heartless. Someone who is not kind. Somebody who's mean. Mean. Uh, Carrie Underwood said a few years ago after she did, I believe it was The Sound of Music that she was in, and uh, she sang it was a live performance, and she said, mean people need Jesus. Cruel people, they need Jesus. Because what they're doing is they're bringing trouble on themselves. Then it says, the wicked man earns deceptive wages, but he who sows righteousness sows, uh, reaps a sure reward. A sure reward. Reaps a sure reward. So, this wicked man, he's out, he's, you know, doing his thing, and he's stealing, and he's conning, and he's conniving. He's going to get deceptive wages. Deceptive to who? Him. 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 All these scam artists, they're going to bring stuff back on themselves that they do not want. They do not want what they're getting ready to get, but they're going to get it. They're going to get it because all that they're gaining is deception. All that they're part of is deception. 
So this says, but you know what? The person who just keeps working diligently and, and they're sowing righteousness and they're continuing to sow into their family and into their uh, fellowship group and into their community, that's a sure reward. That's good stuff. And it's going to happen because it's sure. Because God's word is sure and it's true. Then it says in Proverbs eleven nineteen, the truly righteous man attains life, but he who preserves evil goes to uh, uh, who pursues evil goes to his death eternal damnation but those who are pursuing pursuing God's word and they're staying righteous they're staying within his will a good life and then eternal life a good life and then eternal life the lord detests men of perverse heart but he delights in those whose ways are blameless. Perverse heart. Have you ever, in all your lives, ever heard of so many perversities there are out there? The internet was just the match to life that keg about people finding ways to be perverse. People joining up with other people to know what perversity is. But these people, those who are following righteousness, those who are following godliness, those who are studying God's word, their ways are blameless. And he loves it. He delights in it. He delights in it. Christmas is just in a few days. And if you've ever watched people open presents that were like, I can't believe you did that. I can't believe you did that. I mean, it's just, they're delighted. They're just delighted. I want the Lord to look at me with delight. I want his eyes to open wide and say, oh, I love that girl. I want him to look over at Jesus and say, Look at that girl. Look at our boy down there. Look at what they're doing. Look how delightful that is in our eyes because they are continuing on a life. Does it say perfect? It does not because we will not be perfect until we get to heaven. Then we will be perfected. But until then, we are going to go about our life. And, and if we stumble and if we fall, we get up. We brush ourselves off. We ask for forgiveness. We go before him with humility. That's where this started off with. Being humble. Standing before him humble. And then living a life that is blameless. You know, stop all of this. I accidentally looked at something. I accidentally sat and read something. I accidentally went into a theater that was showing a movie that I had no business seeing. This is saying, I want to be blameless. I want to be careful. I don't want the Lord looking at me and saying, I, you can blame your own self, Jen. Get your own self in that. This is saying, I want you to live a blameless life. All right. Now, Proverbs uh, eleven twenty one. I've referenced this already two or three times. Be sure of this. The wicked will not go unpunished, but those who are righteous, they will go free. They will go free. So here's the wicked. They're going to face punishment. They're going to. They're going to. But the, but the righteous, we're going to go free. We're going to go free. He who is free is free indeed. Free indeed, free indeed. Listen, when you are free indeed, that means free. Free. No strings attached to you. No bondage on you. No chains around you. No, nothing cluttering up your mind. But this says, but you're going to be free. You're free. You're free to, uh, you know, when you're on an airplane and, and you're all strapped in and, uh, and you've got your little scumbag thing that Roberta created and you've cleaned off 
all the parts of your area, your area. But then when the stewardess comes on and says, oh, you are free to, you know, to roam around. If you have to go to the restroom or whatever, you're free to get up and stretch or any of those things, you're free. That means you can get up. That means you've been sitting there and now you can get up. He who is free, he who is free has been made free through Jesus Christ. If Jesus had not died on Calvary, we would still be offering sacrifices. We would still be finding other ways. But when Jesus died that day for me and for you, that meant we can be free. He changed our destination from being punished to being free. But then we have to make sure we're following the directions. We have to make sure that we are following his directions because it could not be more clear about here's the way I'm going to be, here's the way I'm going to go, here's the way I'm going to walk, and if I do that, I'm going to be free. Or, I'm not doing any of that. I don't need that. That's archaic. That's ridiculous. Nobody's going to do that. I heard a minister used to be a, a close friend of ours and he completely changed his ministry and his teaching because now his word is God would not allow a hell God would not allow a hell then how do you explain the wicked will not go unpunished now you can't just explain that away I know that God's word is true I know it is and I know that there is punishment for the wicked. But there is freedom for the righteous. Freedom for the righteous. Tomorrow we're going to finish. Tomorrow morning is Saturday. We're going to take communion. And we are going to... Is that right? Yeah, tomorrow's Saturday. <clears throat> then we're going to... So we're going to finish up tomorrow morning uh, with 11. Proverbs 11. I know that when I made the Thanksgiving meal, uh, I said I'm going to do... I'm going to do something between now and Christmas. Well, here's my problem, people. My kitchen does not even look like a kitchen right now. I mean, there's they're tearing the floor up, and uh, I can't be down there. I can't be on that floor without shoes on. And, and so, uh, which I know I could put shoes on, but um, they're working down there. So, we're, go we're going to figure this out. The, maybe I will record uh, some of my Christmas... Uh, recipes and then you all can watch them later when the workmen aren't here maybe that'll work maybe that'll work. that's a good idea that's what we'll do all right we'll do that tonight is Friday night live prayer at 7 30 please join us for that time of prayer and also please send us your prayer requests at 202-437-6594 send us your prayer request today we uh, would love to be praying with you about different things. But join us because we need you prayer warriors to be joining with us during that time of prayer. Elder Sam Jones from our ministry, Annie Jones's husband, has passed. Uh, so um, keep Sister Annie and his family in your prayers. Uh, two weeks ago, Sister Annie herself was in the hospital with covid and uh, she is fully recovered and doing very well. And then we received word, uh, not before last, that her husband had passed, Elder Sam Jones. I think he's an elder. So uh, keep that family in your prayers. I'll keep you posted on these funerals. Tomorrow, tomorrow is the funeral for uh, Norris Jones. Uh, so if I'm at the church, I'll just do Bible study from the church tomorrow. I, I don't know if that slipped my mind. So tomorrow is the service for Elder Norris Jones. We will be streaming it. We will be streaming it. Uh, Dwayne Walsh's funeral will be December the 30th. And uh, we will be streaming that also. Uh, the other two, uh, yeah, Wilma King's husband passed. And that is December the 12th. This is a terrible time for all these passings. Uh, keep our church lifted up in your prayers. 
None of these are COVID related. None of these are. These are um, other issues that, uh, that have happened in the lives of these four men who have passed. I love you so much. I thank God for you. Father, today we put this Bible study into your hands. And we pray that you would bless it and that you would break it down. And that you would cause our hearts to overflow with wisdom and understanding. We thank you, Lord. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Tonight, we will be having Friday night prayer live, and that will be communion. Tomorrow morning, we will be taking communion. God bless you.